John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. John 10, 35, I am the son of God. John 10, 9, I am the door. John 15, 1, I am the true vine. John 11, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. John 18, 37, I am the king. John 14, 6, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And then in the tenth place he said, I am Alpha and Omega. In the Greek language, there's what we call our A and our Z. We have A and Z in English. But in the Greek language, they have Alpha and Omega. Alpha is their, their English letter A. Omega that would correspond to our letter Z. Alpha and Omega. And when I turn to Isaiah 14, Isaiah wrote 750 years before the birth of Christ. And he took the first letter Omega and the last letter from the Greek alphabet and he claims eternity of being. He claims to be eternal. Well, that which is eternal has no beginning and has no ending. What he's saying when he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, he's saying, I am the one who came from eternity. I am the one who had no beginning. I will never have an ending. I am God. And notice three times Jesus claimed that title of God. Isaiah 41, 4. Who hath walked and done it, calling the generations from the beginning, I the Lord, the first and with the last, as Alpha and Omega, I am He. Again in Isaiah 44, 6, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The exact words that Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, but she asked him about his identity. And then in Isaiah 48, 12, Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my call. I am he. I am the first. I am also the last. And in those three verses right there, three times, Jesus claimed to be the Alpha and the Omega. That is the God of heaven, the creator of the universe. And when we turn to the New Testament, we find the same thing is true. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8 and 11. Jesus said, I am Alpha and Omega. Didn't leave any doubt about it. I am Alpha and Omega. I'm the eternal one. The beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Now the Almighty and the Alpha and the Omega are the same person. It's all put together for us. And then in verse 11, Jesus said, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send to the seven churches. Then in Revelation 21, 6, He said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega. And then Revelation 22, 13, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And then in Matthew 1, 21, Jesus said, Thou shalt call, Paul said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So Jesus, with his own words and his own mouth, claimed the titles of God over and over for himself. In the third place, there are five divine attributes that only God has. Nobody else can have them but God. And here they are. They are omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, eternality, and immutability. Now those five attributes of God are held only by God Himself. And what do we find when we turn to the New Testament? we find that Jesus claims all five of those for Himself. And what He's doing, He's claiming that He is the God of the Bible. 
Let me give you the first one. Omnipotence. That means all the power. Omni is the Greek word for all. Omni. Omni. Omnipotence. All power. And in Philippians 3.21, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things to himself. And Jesus came and spake unto them saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And so there you have Jesus claiming omnipotence. He said, All power is given unto me. Well, that includes omnipotence. That's what all power is. It's omnipotent. He stilled the storm on Lake Galilee. He healed the leper whose flesh was falling off his bone. He healed Lazarus and raised him from the dead. That takes power. Only God can still a storm. Only God can heal a leper. Only God can raise Lazarus dead for four days in the grave from the grave. Yet Jesus did all those. How can anyone doubt that he's God? I read about a man one time who was preaching about the Lord dividing the Red Sea when Israel crossed the Red Sea. And he did not go into it too much, but he made the statement that the Red Sea was the hottest body of water in the world. And it was near the boiling point at all times. And that God performed a mighty miracle of dividing the Red Sea, freezing the boiling water, and caused the water to stand upright until the children of Israel had gone through. Now he said that in a church where he was holding a meeting. And there was a little boy listening very attentively to the preacher. And he went to school the next day and he said to his teacher, what is the hottest body of water in the world? The teacher said, uh, the Red Sea. And the little boy asked the teacher, was it ever frozen? And the teacher said, of course not, you can't freeze boiling water. He said, well, the evangelist told us last night that God froze the Red Sea. He said, well, you go back and tell the evangelist he's wrong. You can't freeze boiling water. So the little boy came back and told the evangelist what his teacher said. And so the pastor that was doing the preaching there said, turn in your Bible to Exodus chapter 15 and verse 8 and read this where it says, And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together, the flood stood upright as a heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. Now he said, Sonny, you take that Bible verse back and ask your teacher, what is congealed water? So he did, and the teacher said, well, congealed water is frozen water. The lad replied that I guess God did freeze the Red Sea, didn't he? You know, people can get educated beyond their intelligence. Christ claimed the same omnipotence as his Father. But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. He coupled together, he and the Father working together, having the same power. In Isaiah 9, 6, Isaiah called him the mighty God. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Jesus said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, the Almighty. Christ forgives sin. Only God can forgive sin. Colossians 3.13 forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you. And in Mark 2, verses 5 through 7, he saw the sick of the palsy and he said, Thy sins be forgiven thee. Only God can forgive sins. Why doth this man and the Pharisees answer, Speak blasphemies. Who can forgive sins but God only? Well, they didn't know that they were standing 
in front of the very God Himself. Now there's a second one, that's omniscience. That's all knowledge. It's to know everything. I had an uncle one time, we called him Uncle Al. Uncle Al knew everything there was to know. It didn't matter what you asked him, Uncle Al claimed he knew it. But Uncle Al wasn't all that bright, to be honest with you. But he thought he was. A lot of people today, they think they're pretty smart, but when you pin them down, they're not near as smart as they think they are. Christ possessed divine omniscience. He had all knowledge. The Bible says Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man for he knew what was in man. Only God knows men's thoughts but Jesus knew their thoughts. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. He knew where the fish were when they Apostles were out fishing. They didn't catch anything. He said, cast on the right side. And they did. And they caught a great crowd of fish. And he said, take the first fish coin that comes out of the first fish. Take the coin out of his mouth and pay our taxes. How did Jesus know there was a coin in the mouth of that fish? How did he know it would be the first fish? Because he had all knowledge. He was on mission. He knew all about the woman at the well. He said, go call your husband. He said, I don't have one. He said, I know you don't. The one you have now is not your husband. Now that would make pretty good preaching today. Also, he knew who would betray him. He said to Judas, what you do, do it quickly. And then he saw Nathaniel under the fig tree. And he said, well, what's so remarkable about seeing Nathaniel under a fig tree? Well, what's remarkable about it was that when he saw Nathaniel under a fig tree, the fig tree was 20 miles away from where Jesus was, and there was a mountain between him and Nathaniel. So the mountain didn't cause any problem, and the mileage didn't cause any problem. He saw Nathaniel, no doubt praying, under a fig tree, 20 miles away with a mountain in between them. How did he see that? Because he's omniscient, he's God. He possessed also omnipresence. That means all everywhere. Jesus can be everywhere at once if He wants to be. He said, where two or three are gathered together in My name, there am I in the midst of them. Well, there's more than two or three of us here this morning. That means He is here in our presence this morning. He is in this service this morning. And you know, I... So often when I walk into this pulpit, I can feel His presence. And it encourages me. I know He's here with me. He's omnipresent. He said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. He said, I'm always with you. It doesn't matter where you go or where you are. I'm with you. You can never get away from Jesus if you're a child of God. He's with you everywhere you go. When you get in your car to go to the grocery store, He gets in the car with you. Uh, when you go to church, He goes with you. When you go to bed at night, He's there. I am with you. Now that wasn't just a, a general statement He was making. It's a fact. He's with you. He said, no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Now Jesus, when He said, which is in heaven, was standing on earth when He said that. How could He stand on earth and say the Son of Man, which is in heaven? Because being omnipresent, He's everywhere. He's in heaven and on earth at the same time. There's no place where Jesus isn't. He's God and God is omnipresent. When Jesus slept in the arms of Mary, His mother, you know what He was doing? He was upholding the universe, keeping the stars in their courses. That's what He was doing. You say, well, He was a little babe. How could He do that? Because He's God. He's God. 
And then he has the, um, the attribute of preservation. Jesus doesn't lose anything. I read in Hebrews 1 3, being in the brightness of his glory and express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And then he bestows eternal life. You say, how do you know that? Because he bestowed it upon me. He said in John 10, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You see, I give unto them eternal life, they shall never perish. Did you know that in the Greek it's never, never, never? It is that way in the Greek. They shall never, never, never perish. That's why we Baptists believe in the eternal security of the saints. Because our Lord told us we would never perish. And if we could be lost again, we would perish. But we will. He gives us eternal life. And then quickly, Jesus possessed the attribute of immutability. That means unchangeability. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. That's Hebrews 13, 8. Hebrews chapter 1. Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. When the heavens are on fire, and when the heavens perish, he'll still remain. They shall wax old as a garment, 